Hey guys, welcome back. Very glad to have uh, Sam Burns, Chief Strategist of Mill Street Research, joining us uh, today. Sam, welcome. Nice to have you. Hi, Francis. Thank you for having me. Can you, for our audience and listeners that may not be familiar with Mill Street Research uh, and your good self, can you just give us a background? What is it you guys do uh, and the role you played in that? Sure. So, yeah, so I, I founded Mill Street Research as an independent uh, research firm back in 2016 after having worked at uh, some of the other uh, big banks and brokerage firms uh, doing uh, mostly macro strategy and quantitative research for many years. Uh, so basically decided it was time to, to do it myself and, and do it the way I wanted to do it without the constraints of, a, of an investment bank and things like that. Uh, so I've basically taken the best of the best of all the work that I've done over the years uh, from you know Ned Davis Research or uh, Brown Brothers Harriman, Oppenheimer, State Street, uh, places like that, and uh, and put it all together into a uh, an institutional uh, research uh, product that uh, combines uh, kind of top down asset allocation work with uh, bottom up uh, quantitative stock selection work globally. Um, so that's the idea is to kind of merge both top down and bottom up, but really have an objective you know, indicator you know model based approach to it. Um, so that's what uh, that's what I provide to clients uh, all over the world. And most of your clients are going to be hedge funds and institutions, I grab from that as well. Yes, primarily it's uh, institutions, uh, mutual funds, hedge funds, some small investment advisors. Uh, so it's a very wide range in terms of size. Uh, but yeah, primarily institutional investors that may be changing a bit soon. Uh, starting to roll out a, a new product that will be uh, addressed to uh, individual investors and, and smaller uh, investment advisors soon uh, in January. Okay, interesting, good. Well, uh, that's a development I'm sure you'll keep us abreast of. So, uh, I was doing a little bit of pre-research and I noticed at one point, uh, this may be old news and I'll have you correct, it, uh, correct us, but this might have come in and around uh, the point that the states uh, officially went into recession and uh, you were making out the point the US is not in a recession yet. So let me make sure I grab the date of that. That was November the 11th, so not too, too long ago, about a month ago. Where is the U.S. economy right now? What's your take? It's up to you. Right. So I don't think the, uh, the U.S. economy is in recession at this point. Uh, I think we're definitely slowing rapidly from what had been very strong growth to sort of weaker growth now. And the question will be next year, do we actually go more into recession? <clears throat> I think the economic data has been very much harder to read and to analyze than usual the last few years because of COVID and everything else that's happened. Uh, with you know, supply shocks and you know Russia's invasion and all these kind of things that have that have distorted a lot of the data that we normally would look at. So the question is certainly a valid one in the sense that you could look at some data and argue yes we're we're, we're in a recession or very close to it. You look at other data and it looks you know far from a recession. So I think we're we're definitely slowing. I think the best guess is that we're in that kind of a you know one to two percent growth rate right now uh, in terms of real growth. <clears throat> and then you know as, as we go into next year we'll have to see do we go down to zero and negative. Or do we kind of hold around a very slow uh, rate of growth? Interesting. And um, there, there's this argument. This is, uh, I suppose, alternative media that potentially the, the too much of score has been played on the labor statistics because Jay Powell's regularly referred to, you know, the red hot labor market uh, and the effects of that. I don't think he's using the red hot uh, expression anymore. I'm more paraphrasing and having a bit of. Uh, 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 Chuckle at his expense, but uh, it, 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 where do you stand on that? Because in, in one hand, um, it looks like you know the non-farm perils are accepted, and on the other hand, it seems there's there's a view that uh, it's overinflating quite substantially in the nature of it. Is this a policy error? Is he going to be both late to the tightening potentially, and then late to the cuts uh, as well? Where, where, what's your take? Yeah, I think that's really the big risk right now is that the Fed will over tighten and make a policy mistake if they haven't already. Um, I think, yeah, there's a lot of debate about the, the labor market data. Certainly the establishment survey that on farm payrolls has been much stronger than the household survey has been in terms of job creation and kind of the, the, the intensity. Um, and I think there's a lot of um, uh, noise in the data. There's also some potentially some lag in the data. Um, and some of that is because of what happened with COVID that the, if you think of the supply shocks that happen, a lot of those supply shocks related to goods production have mostly been mitigated and actually goods prices in the inflation data have already started you know, slowing down rapidly or even falling. Yeah. It's the services side where inflation uh, is, is still high and where the labor side of the costs you know, is, is, is biggest. 
And that's where uh, you know, Jay Powell has been talking about that services and the labor market is where he's most concerned about. And that's where there's still a constraint on, on supply. I mean, the labor supply is still less than what it would normally be at this stage of a cycle or, or you know, if, if you followed, you know, historical trends excluding COVID. Um, and some of that is due to COVID itself. Some of that is due to knock on effects on immigration and things like that. And so I think there is a, a, a risk that because labor is the one thing that still supplies constraint, that focusing on that too much means that you will then be late. I mean, that's the last thing that's going to change uh, in terms of the economic cycle. You're already seeing manufacturing slowing down. You're seeing goods prices slow down. You're seeing the housing market slow down a lot. You know, a lot of those effects of, of the rate hikes that have already happened are already visible. And if you assume a six to 12 month lag for monetary policy, then you're looking at next year being you know, slower than that. And therefore, you probably don't need to raise rates any further um, if you were looking at the overall picture. If you look only at the job market and then at the uh, non-farm payrolls, then yeah, you would say we're still pretty hot and we still have room to slow. You know quite a bit and looking at you know median wage growth year over year is still pretty high but probably the last three to six months are probably slower so i think there's been a lot of changes that even say you know six to 12 months ago is kind of old news but if you look at year-on-year -year changes which is what the fed does and what a lot of people do you're still getting some of that kind of old data in there that really isn't relevant right now because things have changed so fast and that you know the last six months is probably more relevant uh in terms of the data but the Fed is really attached to that kind of year over year. CPI is at 7%, you know, median wage growth is at 6%. Those are numbers that are still too high for them. And therefore they feel like, at least from a public you know, standpoint, defending their reputation, they've got to stay on the sort of hawkish rhetoric and keep raising rates, or at least talk as though they will, um, in order to avoid people assuming that they're going to fall behind the curve. Uh, so I think you're right there. We're late to the, the party in terms of starting the rate hikes, and they might be late in terms of ending them. And the question is, what is the real net impact on the economy? Meaning, is the economy more resistant to rate hikes now than, say, in 2005, the last time they did a big rate cycle? Uh, and that's really the question right now: is is what is the net impact now versus, say, you know, 15 years ago? Yeah, uh, I, I get that. I have a feeling there's also something else in all of this that might be worth discussing and meaning. And again, it's me looking a little bit laterally. Uh, maybe uh, conspiring uh, somewhat in terms of the dollar's relevance and the BRICS challenge. Is he not going to err on policy side that's also going to continue to retain dollar-based strength? Because the last thing he needs right now is the perception uh, or, or a real fall apart weakness in the dollar, given that it's probably never been more challenged uh, in terms of macroeconomic bifurcation, the BRICS, et cetera, et cetera. So he, he, there's another prompt there for hawkishness. Um, I, I, just as an addendum to that question, uh, as part of a, a, an anecdote, when the euro was launched, um, it was launched with much fanfare, and it was all about you know this alternative to the dollar, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the dollar, I think it was launched around 160, and it, it, it seemed to be the American response was to crush it because it went to about 0.85 I think over the space of a, a, a two-year period just to show who was it's kind of America was the original orangutan in the cage and now they're introducing a new one and this one needs to beat his chest and show that he's still the alpha in the in the in the territory are we are we also is there a dollar strength element to this given the threats uh, I think that you know the Fed is certainly paying attention to the dollar I think there was a, a case earlier this year where the Concern with the dollar was too strong, and it was starting to hurt, uh, you know, U.S. corporations, and people were starting to complain that excessive strength in the dollar was not necessarily good for the U.S. Uh, at that level, and it was also going to provoke weakness in some of the emerging markets that you know borrow in dollars and have a lot of dollar-based exposure. Yeah. That was really, you know, going to hurt them um, more so than, than maybe you really even want to. Uh, so now the dollar has corrected some, you know, the, the, some of the other currencies have rallied. Um, I think the euros ability to, you know, kind of really become an alternative currency to the dollar has weakened over the years. Uh, their, you know, the, the euro's yeah. lack of fiscal support um, has, has shown itself to be a real weakness. Now, that's gotten a bit better. They've, done, they've taken some steps toward, you know, Euro pan-European uh, debt issuance and things like that in response to COVID. But I think the, uh, the dollar's ability to both be the, the biggest and deepest you know, financial market, um, but also be more of a coherent policy structure 
um, means that it's going to be hard for even the euro uh, to take over from it from just a structural standpoint. And we've seen you know seen that play out over the last few years. So I don't think the dollar's you know dominance in the world is really going to be challenged anytime soon from a structural standpoint. I think the dollar could weaken a bit more as the Fed gets to the end of its tightening cycle and other central banks have raised rates and narrowed the gap in, in, in rate differentials between the U.S. and, and other central banks. Um, and because the dollar is a risk-off currency, it certainly has been the last couple of years, people get nervous, they, they buy dollars rather than other currencies. Um, that started to fade a bit as risk appetite has improved a little in the last couple of months. Uh, but I think overall, um, if people are really worried, they're probably still going to you know, go to the dollar in times of crisis. Oh, yeah. Well, I was talking about new threats, not existing. I don't see any currency alternative, in the, definitely not the euro, but I don't see the yuan or anything right now. As, a, as an alternative, but more a new initiative, say a BRICS issue, uh, scaled up, thing of the future, a CBDC or BRICS nations or something like that. Um, I was uh, more referring to those threats. I think the, the euro as an alternative argument is, is probably well, uh, that book's well closed on that one. Uh, but it, it, it seems, so taking a small step back, um, the, 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 it looks like there's going to be a tightening until something breaks. And I was just imagining from an American perspective, you would want it rather to be something that broke off short, like a, and you alluded to this, an emerging FX markets uh, debt situation, uh, than something that broke on short. And it was almost an arm wrestle now, uh, before this tightening cycle, in essence. Um, and also there's the export and importing of inflation. If you're keeping that dollar reasonably warm, if not super hot, um, you're, you're, you're slightly ahead of the pack on your inflation numbers. You've got, say, the UK at 10.7, and I think the US is at 7.1 now after the last update. Uh, it just feels like they want to keep, uh, they want to be um, the better side of that. If they let that dollar come back too much, They'll start importing it back on board the inflation numbers as well. And uh, I, I keep adding second parts, but uh, to this, does that also mean that we, that going forward, it feels like there's going to be stubbornly higher levels of inflation than this Goldilocks period we've had before? So your comments around those two aspects. I think you're right that a strong dollar has helped the U.S. domestically in terms of controlling imported inflation. Now, of course, the U.S. having a smaller proportion of the GDP being tied to imports or exports relative to, say, the U.K. or you know, a lot of other countries, um, you know, the, the, the impact of trade on inflation in the U.S. is going to be less just because the domestic market is much bigger. Um, so I think it's, it is a, a concern, but it's probably not the primary concern. I think the fact that commodity prices globally have come down quite a bit since they peaked around June, arguably, including oil. Um, means that there's probably less risk of that now than there would have been, say, six months ago in terms of a, of a worry. Um, so I think that the, the risk would only come if you saw another supply disruption of some kind, whether it be in commodities or uh, you know, labor, if you know, China really uh, you know, comes under more severe pressure from, from COVID or something, uh, and people can't get their iPhones, you know, all kind of th those kind of things um, that are the risk here. I think if things go as they are currently are, I think the inflation pressures will probably you know, ease. I think the dollar could you know, stay stable or, or ease a bit more, and it wouldn't be a concern for the Fed. Um, I think, yeah, the, the, the smaller countries, um, particularly you know, the UK, now that they're outside the European Union, uh, have more risk of that kind of imported inflation, and, uh, and, and therefore are going to have to you know, uh, take bigger policy steps potentially to deal with it. Um, it's unclear if they will or not, but I think that's where the, uh, the risk is there. Um, but I think, uh, I think stability will be a good thing in general. Uh, and I think if once monetary policy becomes less dramatic, meaning there won't be 75 basis point rate hikes going around everywhere um, you know, next year, that will probably help currencies in general become less volatile than they've been. I mean, they've been very volatile most of last year. Um, so that's kept you know, interest rates volatile and the currencies and commodities have all been very volatile. I think some signs of stability across uh, all those assets would be, you know, would be beneficial. I think it would kind of calm down the Fed and as well as investors, um, uh, you know, looking forward. So I, I don't, I don't see the dollar being a big risk for next year, um, as long as, uh, you know, the, the the current kind of trajectory kind of plays out. I mean, the Fed slows down and eventually stops its rate hikes. 
other central banks catch up a bit and inflation will slow down just because uh, the price of oil has come down, a lot of the other commodities have come down. Um, I think that will start to you know, filter through the system over the next, say, six to 12 months. Uh, right now, as we speak, funny enough, we've got um, a voracious uh, yen gobbling up uh, everything. It's trading at 131.55. I'm keeping half an eye uh, on the one screen. This is following uh, the events that I'm sure you uh, are familiar with. Uh, the, the, the allowance or the leakage on the tenure to start inching its way towards the, the, the 50 uh, basis points uh, level. Um, is, uh, is this going to be enough, uh, taking you offshore for Japan to alleviate, oh, well, it's doing great now, but alleviate what turned out to be a terrible uh, last two years in terms of the USD JPY and other crosses on the end? Uh, I think it's certainly a first step, and certainly Japan has been the big holdout in terms of monetary policy globally and not raising rates, and, you know, and they haven't certainly had as much of an inflation problem either. But I think this shows you that the market pressures on the Japanese bond market and the yen uh, have kind of gotten to the policymakers now, and they feel like they have to at least you know, widen the bands and, and allow for more latitude there now that rates both in the US and in Europe are substantially higher than, than those in Japan. And that, that, that kind of that, that much tension, but you know, that much of a gap in, in interest rates is hard to to manage from a, from a policy standpoint, and particularly when you've had such a restrictive policy in Japan, where they really kept you know rates right around zero for a long time, and very aggressive with their uh, you know quantitative you know easing and, uh, and so forth, and, and controlled the whole yield curve. Um, so any sign of, of that kind of you know cracking, I think is going to have you know a market impact like you're seeing today, um, even though the actual change in rates you know is not that big. It's the perception that you know that kind of dam is breaking a bit for for Japanese policymakers, and that they may have to then you know move closer to what the rest of the developed world is doing in terms of you know monetary policy, and that would be a shift uh, certainly for the yen. So if the yen strengthens, you know then that's you know a little bit more dollar weakness. Uh, but again, the dollar has room to weaken, and the yen certainly has room to, to appreciate before it becomes a problem uh, for anyone. So I think this is more correcting what had been sort of an extreme move in one direction more than yeah. uh, you know, kind of going off a cliff or, or something that would be really worrisome at this level. Um, and I think that the, the Japanese you know, policymakers are probably going to be pretty cautious about you know, doing anything too dramatic too quickly. Uh, certainly historically, that hasn't been their, uh, their MO. Um, so they might widen the bands a little bit more. They might be willing to, you know, to go up a little higher. Uh, but I would be surprised if they would you know, take anything too dramatic a step um, to, to move away from what they've, what they've been doing. Uh, so I think this is more the market's response to um, the perception that they've now changed policy more than the policy itself. So there could be a bit more volatility still to come on that cross, particularly maybe uh, at some point a, a rebound because uh, surely aren't they restricted mathematically? I think uh, last time I heard there were 280% of GDP on debt and I'm, I don't think that's got any better and they own so many things. Um, by letting the interest rates go up to to hide, uh, will they start to run into the same affordability issues, which also allow you to dovetail that into the Fed uh, actually is no longer making, uh, is, is now um, at that point where it's being called technically insolvent. And let me tag on the Bank of England that used to make uh, transfer payments to its treasury on money it had made on quantitative easing done during the subprime era is now uh, what was highlighted that there's an agreement to quit pro pro and that the treasury will have to make the Bank of England whole now on a shortfall on it. So we've got the actual central bank institutions coming under duress. I've mentioned the yen. How far can it go on the yen rates before it becomes uh, unaffordable? When does it break from that point? And what's your take on the solvency of the other two and, and the repercussions or the meanings of that? to us macroeconomically for central banks to be uh, actually now almost, in, I think in the UK, as would be, it was around 180 billion, and it might be more than they spend on defense. I speak under, uh, under correction uh, on that. So quite a considerable sum. No, you're right. I mean, the, the, if people had gotten used to the uh, central banks essentially you know, making money off their bond holdings and then being able to, to transfer whatever you know, was left after their expenses over to the, to the treasury, uh, and that's really been the case for the Fed and the Bank of England. Um, I think the fact that that's changed 
um, it, it does change the perception, I guess, in some ways, and it might have some effect on the, uh, you know, the, the, the what's published as the you know, fiscal deficits and you know, spending for the Treasury. Um, probably more so we have for the Bank of England. I think, you know, on, on a real macro basis, it's probably not going to have a big impact, just because, um, you know, the, the whatever amount that the Federal Reserve was transferring to the U.S. Treasury was, was still not a big proportion of the overall U.S. budget and certainly was not something that they were you know, counting on to, to pay bills with. Um, and both the Bank of England and the, you know, the U.S. are currency issuers. They can print money and run deficits you know, as, as they need to. Um, so they're not going to run out of money. Central Bank won't actually go into to default or anything like that. I think it's more um, of, a, of a sort of a balance sheet sure, thing sure. that shows up in the numbers. Mm -hmm. But won't uh, won't really affect what they do or their, their policy choices. The Fed will still pursue its quantitative tightening and run down its balance sheet, uh, regardless of what kind of the paper losses look like. Um, so I don't think it's going to change their their policy views very much. Um, but it does kind of remind us that um, if you know anyone who has who had lo was long a lot of bonds when U.S. Treasuries were at one and a half percent are probably nursing pretty big losses now that they're at three and a half or four. Um, and that you know for the Fed it doesn't matter. You know they can print money. The Treasury can print money. Everybody else, you know, cannot. And so I think just to, to, to remind us, you know, kind of the size of the losses to fixed income portfolios globally, um, and particularly for for some of the you know countries like the UK and US, where rates have gotten very very low, um, partly thanks to central bank action, and are now going the other way, um, you know, reminds us all of kind of what you know what those losses might look like in the private sector, um, and the fact that both stocks and bonds have had pretty substantial losses this year. Which is very rare. You know, normally, if you get big losses in stocks, you'd get gains in bonds, and, and this year you haven't. So uh, I think, from a policy standpoint, it's it's not that important. Um, I think the uh, you know the U.S. federal deficit has already come down quite a bit from where it was a year or two ago. Anyway, um, it's it's sort of you know moderate levels now. So I don't think whatever the Fed's transfers are going to do are, are, are that uh, big a, a mover uh, overall. Um, I think that you know the Bank of England and the Fed can manage it. Um, but it does kind of highlight, you know, what's changed in terms of the, you know, the, the structural tailwinds and headwinds for uh, for fixed income and for you know, monetary policy. Yeah, interesting concepts. Asset classes that you think will actually do well with so many risks to the downside as we go into 2023. Uh, Sam, uh, where do you hide? Um, well, you know, certainly they've made cash look, look a lot better now than it has been for a while. Um, and so those, you know, if you're looking for a conservative, you know, holding, then, uh, you know, then, then good old short-term treasuries look pretty good. Now, from a, from a, you know, riskier standpoint, actually, the uh, equity risk model that I use um, in, in my work, uh, which is, has kind of has a, you know, one to three, maybe six month horizon, so it, it can change, uh, but it's actually been getting better um, for the first time, really in a year, year and a half now. So it had been pretty sort of cautious for most of this year and has been improving. Uh, on the signs of maybe risk appetite coming off the floor, essentially. If you look back at kind of mid late October, you know the pessimism in markets, uh, whether it be equities, bonds, you know whatever, was very very high. You know a lot of extreme pessimism, everyone getting very nervous um, and very worried, and you know selling. And so I think you know when you come off of those extremes and pessimism, you do have the chance to to, to you know to do better. Um, and that a lot of the bad news that we're going to maybe even see has been, or at least was priced in. Um, so I think, you know, equities actually do okay in 2023, as long as there are no new major, you know, shocks, no major new invasions in Europe or, you know, new pandemics, um, that, uh, that, that earnings might, you know, be decent. And that if bond yields do come in a bit further, they could should have a bit of re-rating in equities and, you know, have a decent, you know, single digit gain in equities, which, you know, would be pretty good. It might even be, you know, beat the returns to cash. Um, so I think I think equities actually are, are a decent place to be right now, looking forward uh, after a really rough year of, uh, of both equities and bonds uh, kind of kind of contracting. I'm still nervous about bonds. I don't think there's a lot of upside there, um, given the inverted yield curve that you see a lot of places. Um, but I think it's probably not as that the risk has, has gone down, meaning that uh, um, that the worst is probably over for the bond market uh, for the long end. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, that I'd prefer to own the shorter end still in, 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 in fixed income than the long end. But I think equities actually look pretty decent, particularly the kind of the value large cap side of things um, within equities uh, should, should actually do reasonably well uh, going into the first, at least the first half of next year. 
just given that there's a lagging effect to the interest rates, um, I'm finding it, I'm more prone to have an alternative view that the risk is still generally not a good place. I'd like your cash almost best as, as your suggestions. With the lagging interest rates, the effect thereof, you know, people refining homes, a lot of you got to wait till a certain number of people have had been forced into these new deals. Um, there's a lot of talk about consumers being spent, pinched, uh, despite uh, the comments about this uh, strong labor market. A lot of uh, this might be the, the lower middle and the working working classes. Um, there seems uh, there seems to be, and then you look at Amazon's recent performance, for example, uh, it's falling really really hard, which is a online retail purchase. Uh, other consumer, we're not due a consumer, at least from a point of view of consumer staple type and retail, uh, a real downturn in earnings outlooks, which could overshadow equities. That's right. That's right. I think there's definitely going to be more pressure on uh, on some of the retailers and, and consumer discretionary. They, they're getting a bit of help from lower, uh, you know, fuel costs. Thing, you know, gas prices are down, um, and that's that's it's a bit of a help. But um, a lot of the benefit from the you know the COVID stimulus um, that we saw you know in 2020 and 2021 in the U.S. But, and globally has now you know faded. I think there's still a built-up sort of balance sheet cushion to some degree, uh, both for consumers and for uh, some state and local governments um, that can help cushion that a little bit as we go into next year. Um, but that's that's you know faded a bit. There's certainly not going to be any more um, you know stimulus checks going out to people, which I think is really what kept the consumer going. I think there's a, there's a lag effect. I think there's been a shift from you know, the good side of things, you know, people buying stuff, uh, to buying services and going back to restaurants and hotels and traveling, um, which uh, is put pressure on the services side of the economy, whereas the, the good side, uh, even including online retailing, has you know has, has slowed down quite a bit. So I think there's been a, a, a rotational shift within the economy from goods to services, and you're seeing that both in the uh, the top level data as well as the inflation data. Um, I think there'll be, you know, a mix of that going into next year. I do think there's the consumers are coming into a slowdown in a better position than they did, say, 2005, 2006. Uh, banks are certainly in a better position than they were back then uh, when you had the last big, really big rate cycle. Um, so I think the sensitivity of the economy to interest rates is probably less now than it was, say, you know, 15 years ago, um, but it's still sensitive. And so I think as, as the housing market slows down further and, uh, and people start to have to adapt to uh, paying higher rates, you're not going to get 0% financing on cars anymore and things like that, uh, that there will be you know, a moderation in spending, uh, even with the labor market stays you know, decent. I think the labor market will probably slow down as well. Wages will probably slow down and the you know, growth in labor will, will slow down as well as you go into next year. The question will be, you know, will the Fed see that and respond to it fast enough to avoid over tightening? Uh, or at least over tightening anymore. Um, I think that's really the risk is does the data catch up fast enough? Um, but I think the uh, the overall consumer picture is less than it was, but not disastrous yet. I think it's sort of going to be okay because there is still some wage growth, some some uh, job growth, and there is still that leftover cushion from the COVID stimulus that's still uh, uh, kind of supporting things a bit. Um, so I don't see this falling off a cliff. I think it more of being just a continued slowdown until the point uh, at which either the Fed has gone too far uh, or there's some other calamity somewhere that uh, you know that derails things. But I think that uh, you know fiscal policy is probably at least as important, if not more important, than monetary policy now. Um, I think that you know having um, you know running uh, you know some sort of fiscal deficit, um, you know three to five percent of GDP is probably where you where it should be and should should stay in that range. I think trying to you know, tighten the budget, you know, from a U.S. fiscal standpoint too far would be a substantial risk, uh, potentially as much or more than the Fed would be. Um, I don't see that being a risk right now, um, just given the, the state of, you know, politics in the U.S., but I think that's the risk now is that, uh, that the fiscal policy tries to overcompensate and tighten too much going into next year uh, alongside the monetary policy tightening, and that would, that would potentially combine to produce a, a more severe recession. I don't see that right now, but I think that's the risk. I certainly think you, what you just described there seems to apply for the UK because they've gone for a much harsher uh, tightening um, of fiscal policy, almost back to austerity uh, and tax increases, quite substantial tax increases due to uh, 
a, a lot of these knock-on effects, all in an environment which is very high inflation, still double digits. Um, so uh, I, I certainly see the possibility of much harder landings elsewhere. But it seems at the moment you 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 think it's still possible for a soft landing, but you do mention uh, you know calamities elsewhere and or over tightening and a downside. Do the, the macro ris risks still remain to the downside, or are there shock upsides that are, that, that people are not seeing? No, I don't think there's a shock upside. I think it's more <clears throat> a question of if you are currently expecting a severe recession next year and you don't get one, then that's the, the relative upside relative to expectations. And I think uh, there's certainly some, you know, of my fellow strategists out there who are predicting, you know, big, you know, big recession, big declines next year. Um, and certainly uh, some economists are talking about that more now. Um, and I think the, the, the surprise would be that we do get sort of a, a soft landing or a muddle through Maybe you get you know a mildly negative growth, but I think you know that you could get a scenario where things are sort of okay, uh, and that's certainly what happened you know after 1994, as you may recall. Uh, you had an aggressive tightening cycle. If the market you know corrected and, and really you know kind of did nothing for a long time, the bond market had a terrible year, and then 95 was a better year because the Fed stopped and started to ease a bit, and you had that kind of soft landing where it was close to recession but not quite, and. Uh, and then you know stocks could you know could outperform, and we're not probably not to that level of you know, expecting a 30% up year like, like 1995 was, but I think you could get a, you know a positive year as long as things are not as bad as people would maybe priced in. And I think if the Fed does turn out to be a little bit less uh, hawkish than what they've talked about recently, um, and the fiscal policy does kind of you know keep up, I mean it doesn't turn too constrictive. Now I think you're right about the about the UK. Um, they're definitely in more danger of over tightening on both fronts, monetary and fiscal, um, and because they don't have uh, the kind of the benefit of, of having a, you know the, the common market with Europe and some of that you know to, to balance things out, I think the UK is at more risk of that. They've certainly benefited from the commodity cycle. You know, energy is a big component of the UK you know equity market, um, and so they've been a relative beneficiary of the commodity side. I think that's going to fade you know, going into next year and already has. So that relative benefit is easing. Uh, whereas continental Europe has much less of that commodity exposure um, and is going to be a little more sensitive to, you know, kind of the consumer side and the global emerging market side of things. Uh, so if that holds up, then Europe, continental Europe could do better than the UK, but there's definitely risk to, to, to Europe there um, if they um, <clears throat> become too aggressive with trying to, you know, bring their budget budgets down, budget deficits down, or tighten policy to fight what is really just a, a knock-on effect of, of, of Russia and energy. Uh, for the most part right now uh, rather than excessive you know demand underlying demand from consumers yeah um i, I want to take you to uh, events of march 2020 um it didn't receive great i was shocked how little publicity it received uh and then it largely wasn't covered but there was a substantial uh fed bailout uh it's appeared uh of a number of core banks both European and uh, US. Uh, BNP Paribas receiving 3.69 trillion, the usual suspects, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, um, and then uh, Barclays, uh, Credit Suisse, et cetera. Some of those that Credit Suisse had a little bit of a, a you know, wobble recently on fears of a bank run. Um, when, you, when you're talking of, uh, I get the sense that you're erring to a more slightly less benign that you're finding most uh, commentators potentially too many people being a bit too hysterical uh, and you're, you're, you're seeing the possibility barring major outsets of it being, you know, a, a bit overpriced uh, in. Um, how do you square the, the derivative position, the dark aspects of money, uh, as they often refer to, that people seem to have very little understanding and very great difficulty in quantifying that such a sum that I think exceeded 20 trillion. Uh, I mean, the average was about two and a half trillion going to a variety of seven or eight banks, um, no, which well surpassed the, uh, the, even the stimulus package. Um, how do you square that circle as being uh, uh, the banks are stronger, which was one of your other comments? Where, where are we not? I'm always just feeling that there's this dark black box entity that's on the verge of exploding and that will be the last to hear and that there's clearly been plenty of duct tape being applied in terms of Fed funds because essentially you're talking about money that's gone to offshore banks that the Fed uh, has provided 
that should annoy American taxpayers uh, alone, just on that point in principle. So in terms of those aspects uh, and uh, the time bomb nature of it all, what's your what's your comment ref derivatives or balance sheets and a lot of other things of that nature? that we get a very occasional mumblings of. Right, now I think, um, <clears throat> you know, certainly the, the COVID experience there in March, 2020, you know, highlighted again, how, uh, you know, if once once things start to really to turn, then it becomes a global phenomenon. And it's not just, you know, either one bank or even US banks or, or any one country that can, you know, manage it by themselves. Uh, but it really reminds you that, you know, the Fed, the US is the, the lender of last resort not only for U.S. banks, but globally, and that um, that those swap lines and things that you're talking about uh, that they had to extend, you know, to, to so many central banks and, and, and even you know, commercial banks globally um, were, you know, the result of, you know, markets kind of not stopping <clears throat> working, excuse me, that uh, when you get that level of disruption that <clears throat> you need, you know, the lender of last resort to step in. And, and they did, and that prevented, I think, you know, something worse from happening. But I think you know it does highlight that uh, some banks and some, certainly some of the, the weaker European banks, um, you know, probably would have been on the verge of it, and that maybe the European, um, you know, financial structure, the the, the the ECB and the the governments are still not fully set up to provide the kind of support that they would need to do in a real in a real crisis like that. Now they, they've gotten better at it, I guess, um, but they still have you know coordination issues and uh, you know kind of overlapping you know responsibilities. Whereas you know the, the U.S. being uh, you know having one central bank to to uh, control everything, you know had the power to do that, and in this case they they used it. I think they yeah they, they definitely decided to you know go on the err on the side of you know offering too much money than too little um, because it was such an unusual you know pandemic related thing. I mean it wasn't you know the 2008 financial crisis was a you know man-made financial you know, system issue. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, you know, a pandemic, you know, pathogen is, is completely different and required, you know, economies to shut down for a while and things like that, that were, uh, you know, sort of, and so that the financial effect was a, a knock-on effect from what was happening in kind of in the real world. Um, and so I think there was a better argument for that in this case than there may have been, you know, in, in other cases. Uh, but it does tell you that the financial system globally still relies on the U.S. and still relies on a lender of last resort to come to the rescue when things like this happen. I will certainly hope that they don't happen very often. Um, and certainly, you know, banks like uh, some of the ones you mentioned, the Swiss banks, uh, or, you know, Deutsche Bank or things like that, they've had a lot of problems for years. They're still fairly weak. You know, their stock prices certainly reflect that. And um, I think some of those you know, European banks, you know, probably need to you know, have more work done to, to bring them back up to speed. The U.S. banks, I think, certainly have a better balance sheet standpoint now than they, than they did. And certainly all the stimulus that happened after COVID on, on the fiscal side did kind of flow into the banking side as well, meaning their assets, you know, deposits are way up and their loans are lower relative to deposits. So I think from a from a balance sheet standpoint, the U.S. banks are in, in better shape. Now we'll see what happens if the if Fed's quantitative tightening, you know, goes on much farther and they start to drain those reserves um, that they've built up over the last couple of years. Um, but the, the, you know, the European banks have not had the same benefit to, the, to that degree uh, from stimulus and from uh, you know from building up reserves uh, maybe that the U.S. banks have. So I have more confidence in the U.S. side of things than, than in Europe or, or elsewhere. Uh, but I think um, you know it reminds you that that, that, that the, the Fed it really is still the, the center of the financial universe from a monetary policy standpoint and from a standpoint of keeping things afloat when things go wrong. Um, and so whether that's emerging markets or other developed markets, uh, I think you, you still got to, you know, rely on them. And so it reminds you that um, that monetary policy in the U.S., you know, is going to have, you know, effects elsewhere. And I think that's, you're still seeing that to a lesser degree now as the Fed's been raising rates. You're seeing the knock-on effects elsewhere. And in fact, the other central banks kind of have to catch up to some degree and narrow the gap so they're not too far away from uh, what the Fed is doing. And even Japan today is starting to do that. So I think it's all tied together in the sense of uh, whatever the Fed does, other central banks are going to have to do as well. Um, and that the, uh, the Fed is the only place where you can get that kind of money that quickly um, to, to support things. Um, so I think it, it's, it's you know, um, ideally, yeah, you wouldn't want to rely on the central bank to do that. And I think people are upset, you know, that, that that's still the case in some ways. But I think the way the system is structured now, uh, there's no way around that. And I think the, um, 
uh, you know, the, the effect on the taxpayer is probably less than it looks like just because most of the money, you know, is loans that were paid back and the U.S. taxpayer was not necessarily on the hook for it. Um, but even then, um, it was... Providing they get paid back and are service that are at reasonable rates and they aren't all fold up into some debt re reset uh, of system, I think, yeah, that's fair comment. I would right, say, you know, many exactly, Mexican yeah. banks that received money uh, as they were European, although I, I quite accept the European banks are in a poor state. Uh, and I was also referring to the scale of it, you know, where individual institutions are actually receiving up to 3.7 between, uh, two, you know, two, two and a half, 3.7, the scale uh, and the size of it. Uh, you're talking about, you know, one institution receiving more than 50% of the entire stimulus package and being repeated eight or nine times. Um, does that not point to a, a highly tenuous uh, fragility element that such was even needed? Uh, don't forget this was in March 2020, so the effect of the the, the, the business shutdown had not yet occurred. We'd had the repo concerns of 2019, uh, sort of August, September, October, I think it was. Um, and it seems it seemed that was uh, a rush to deal with the interbank lending markets as much as anything else. Uh, so, I, I, yeah, my comment was, wow, uh, how bad do things have to be that a single uh, and no argument that it is the Fed that does it. I can't see anyone else being in a position to do it. Um, have to issue so much money. It just makes it feel very tenuous to me uh, that people are holding bags that big, uh, that th they require liquidity uh, uh, provisions to that extent. All be the fact that people may be over borrowed to be super safe and to, you know, uh, plaster some cracks with additional cash. Uh, it just seems very tenuous. Uh, but that, that's just why I come back, Coco, and you're welcome to refer back on that as well if you like. But I haven't heard you mention precious metals. What's your take uh, in, the, in their role as part of a portfolio in the environment that is, in my assessment, going to have a certain stagflationary overtone? And I actually think we could be in what a hyper stagflation. In other words, we're going to have stubbornly high inflation for an extended period, although we'll dip on any major demand destroying events. For example, the second pandemic would have the same effect as the first one did <laughs> on demand. Um, but <clears throat> Um, what's your comments on metals and what, uh, and also about the, the potential very low growth that the easy growth period is over, sustained low growth with consistent regular bouts of stubbornly high inflation? Because it's a monster, if you, if you recall, uh, and I think we're similar generation, uh, you know, you had three bouts from the 60s and the 70s, you had an inflationary high, then you had a dip, then you had a higher inflationary high, you had another dip. In it's a monster that have, needs a stake, a wooden stake driven through its heart that's best killed small. And it, once it's got to a certain size, uh, there's, a, there, there's a lot needed in the killing, as Falker found out eventually with his super cycle, which we clearly could not sustain that level of rates uh, today. Uh, so golden gold and uh, stagflation, your takes. Well, with the caveat that I'm certainly not an expert on, on gold and, and metals, um, I think, um, that you know, there might be a, a, you know, a role for them as a, as a diversifier in, in certain portfolios. Most of my clients are going to be you know, constrained from, from allocating mostly to, uh, you know, to precious metals directly. Um, now, I think you know, that the, the 60s and 70s kind of uh, scenario is unlikely to, to unfold this time just because the longer term secular uh, demographics, uh, you know, debt levels and you know, technology and things like that have shifted to the point that you're not likely to get the same combination of, you know, fiscal and monetary policy being, you know, too easy, and the, you know, baby boom generation and the, you know, the, the, the real, you know, buildup of uh, consumer demand that came from that demographic swing that just started, you know, in the 60s and went through the early 80s. Um, so I think that, you know, demographically, you know, population growth is much lower now, um, and that uh, the productivity, you know, continues. And I think that. Um, sustained high inflation or, or, you know, further big bouts of, uh, of high inflation would require, you know, something like, you know, big supply constraints. So, you know, and even in the 70s, you had the, the first oil embargo in 1973, and you had another one in 1979. And so you had multiple events, in addition to the Vietnam War, 
and uh, you know, and sort of the guns and butter policy in the U.S. of you know both uh, social policies and you know financing wars uh, that were going on at the same time. That all of those things had to add up together to get the kind of inflation that you got then. Um, I don't see those things happening all together to produce the same sort of super cycle inflation, you know, going forward now. Um, I, I, like I say, I think- um, well, We've got Russia and Ukraine and the bifurcation of the supply chain. We've seen substantial runs on uh, metals. We are in a proxy war of some form. Uh, there always seems to be one. Uh, we have a lot of different things, but that can be argued. At, at that period during the 70s and 80s, we could make the, the, the case that it was a slowly expanding, although the real globalization seems to really kick in in the 90s. And there was already a, a, an opening up uh, of China as a manufacturing site, other places, Singapore, and then the offshoring cycle was starting. We're now getting a bit of a reverse offshoring. Uh, we're getting a onshoring uh, and a friend shoring and various other concepts uh, that are occurring uh, that are more constricted. So we are actually reducing um our selection choice which is leading to higher average costs as well um do, do you not see that as leading to raising the floor in terms of what's going to be a normal uh potential inflation rate uh or do you think this is going to be resolved and there'll be some sort of peace treaty and normal trade will resume i think there probably will be a, some constraint on the sort of the globalization trend and the the, the, the pattern of you know, more outsourcing to, to more different countries. I think that will, will start to, to ease a bit. Um, I think there's uh, there's still a very high incentive to look for, you know, the lowest cost place to, to build things and to make things um, that will that will continue. Um, and I, so I think, yeah, it may raise the floor a little bit, but I think the, the ceiling is also going to be constrained by the fact that just there, there aren't as many, you know, the population growth in China as well as the U.S. and most of Europe has really slowed down dramatically, and there just aren't going to be as many people demanding things as there there were uh, before, and they're getting older. So that the, the demand side of things will shift, you know, in terms of the demographics, both the number of people and the age of people. Um, you know, even in places like China, which had for a long time, you know, been growing so rapidly, they had to, you know, try to, to use the one-child policy to reduce it. I think they've now maybe go overshot that, and seeing their working age population is already slowing. And so that I think the demand side of things will also slow alongside the uh, those constraints on supply. Now, certainly, if you know we lose another major oil producer to a war like Russia uh, has, you know, recently or something like that, you know, that could that could you know throw a wrench into things. Although there is a you know a longer term trend towards trying to move off of fossil fuels, I, I suppose. Um, but I think that uh, the, the debate will be whether the uh, developments in technology um, you know, improvements. And the, the slowdown in, in sort of the demographic side of things are enough to offset whatever might be at the supply, uh, you know, kind of limitations or lack of growth in supply that we saw in the 80s and 90s when you're right, yeah, uh, sort of the wall came down in Eastern Europe and you had all of those people become part of the global uh, workforce. You had China's side of the global workforce growing. Um, now that's a lot of that has slowed down. Um, parts of India and Africa are certainly, you know, uh, still, um, potential areas that could be expanded and places where you could see growth uh, from both a demographic standpoint and an, an outsourcing standpoint. But um, so I think there may be rotation and kind of where things you know get made and, and how they get done. Uh, so I, I don't see the structural issues that drive inflation um, unless there is either you know, major policy errors or uh, some sort of you know wars or pandemics or things that would constrain supply uh, to such a degree that, that uh, you know, you can't uh, adapt around it. So I think the, the response to COVID has shown that there are ways to, to work around these things um, and that we've, we've stabilized things, certainly from the good side of things, um, that, that, you can, you, that there's now, you know, st store shelves are stocked, uh, you know, goods prices aren't really rising much anymore, uh, that it's really only the labor side, the services side, and that could be really um, dealt with a lot by just improving immigration policy, frankly. Um, both in the U.S. and, and globally, um, there's there's plenty of places where um, immigration is restricted, and you could balance out a lot of these uh, labor and supply related issues by just you know allowing a little bit more uh, movement of labor uh, globally. Um, so I think there's there's ways that that could be dealt with um, that would not re result in hyperinflation or you know, structural loss of supply. Um, but I think the the risk of policy mistakes when things are a bit more fragile like this um, is, is, is grown. 
Um, so you got to hope that the policymakers, you know, do their job well and uh, and don't make any really drastic, you know, policy errors with either over tightening or you know being so loose with policy that it, it then per, you know creates inflation, uh, as is kind of what you had in the 60s and 70s. The wild card of central bank digital currencies, which seems to be the new way, uh, I call it the surveillance finance that will come, which will probably have some social scoring and some rather dark uh, backdoors that uh, many of us are now expecting. Are we just waiting for such a policy era that uh, we are for, for that to be the opportunity, as inverted commas, that they'll use to bring this in? Or do you think there's a, a case scenario where this is just benignly introduced in a normal market condition, set of market conditions? Yeah, I mean, for the US, I don't see central bank digital currency really being uh, likely. I think they're looking at it. Uh, I don't see it being a um, a major shift in the way the, you know the, the Treasury or the Fed wants to, to to make the U.S. financial system work. Um, I think you know basically the dollar is already digital in many ways. Um, there's really not a need for it in, in places like the U.S. Um, I can I can see the argument maybe in China where that sort of social control you're talking about and being able to m both track and control what people do with their money. Is, is stronger in, in you know authoritarian regimes. Um, I think there'd be more of an inclination to do it there. Um, most of what I've seen and heard from you know Fed governors and places people like that has been more you know looking at it because it's, it's certainly a big topic right now and there might be aspects of it that, that you'd want to look into. But from a widespread adoption standpoint and, and sort of forcing U.S. consumers to use a, a digital currency of some kind rather than what we're currently using. Um, it seems like a long way off, if, if ever. Uh, and the same is true probably for, you know, Western Europe and places like that, uh, where it would be even harder to, to implement, you know, as structurally. So uh, I don't see it as a major risk. I think, you know, the, uh, the ability to control what people do with their money and track what they do with their money is, frankly, already pretty high. Um, so I don't see that the, the governments are going to have a, are going to want to fight the fight that would be necessary to make that happen in developed Western economies. Um, I think in authoritarian regimes, it might be more appealing. Um, it's still going to be probably you know, a fight to some degree. Um, but I don't see the upside for the policymakers to do it. I don't really see the upside as, as a taxpaying, law-abiding US citizen. I don't know what I would get out of it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where the, the impetus for that on a structural, fundamental basis is really going to come from. I think there's a lot of interest in it. And I think it's pushed the Fed to like that. The Fed, what is it, Fed now, or that they've increased the um, uh, speed with which they can do interbank, you know, current uh, transactions and clear trades and things like that. So instead of being three days, it's now one day, and you know, there's more real-time processing of, uh, you know, bank transactions and financial transactions. I think that's been an impetus to say, well, why are things paper on done on paper and you know, take so long, uh, and why is it inefficient, you know? saying, well, we, maybe we'll just do it digitally and you know, use, use, use a blockchain or something like that. You know, the Fed says, well, actually, we can do it with the systems we have. We just have to improve them. And they've, they've actually started to do that already. So um, and, you know, if they want to know what you've done with your credit card or anything like that, they can already do that. They can already put money in your bank account. We saw that with the Treasury stimulus. Uh, money just showed up in everyone's bank accounts you know, pretty easily. Um, so I don't think there's a a structural impetus for that that would be necessary to make it widespread um, in the U.S. or Canada or you know Western Europe. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen in, in some of the other emerging markets, but again, it's harder to do that by yourself uh, as, 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 as a closed system um, rather than something that would be global. It might be the bricks that break it first. That's my suspicion. Uh, but I just wonder that once others start doing it, is it not a technological lag impression by you not doing it? It takes a brave man to say, I'm not participating and look like you're behind the curve, uh, especially when there's so many governmental advantages of control uh, and data, and data being the new gold uh, in terms of things. So I, I feel that maybe the US won't be the first, but they wouldn't want to be too far behind in following as a personal thought. but um, I, I, I hope and I sincerely wish because I don't, I don't see good things coming out of those things for the end man in the street particularly. I think it's intrusive. Possibly they could parallel run it with a lot of systems and those who are optional and benignly unconcerned about data and, and privacy and various other things could get some minor incentives in partaking it. 
uh, and then you could parallel run it maybe with the dollar and then they'll slowly add more features to the one they most want to retain uh, um, and slowly the one withers on the vine. Um, excellent. Sam, that's been an interesting discussion to have with you. Uh, people that want to, first of all, initially it's only institutions, but you did mention um, retail. So do you want to detail your retail offering and then for any institution, we have hedge funds that are watching our channel as well. We actually have a few in our community. Um, how uh, should people find you and how should they engage and uh, please give us your, um, your elevator pitch as well. Sure. So certainly uh, yeah, my website, uh, uh, millstreetresearch.com is where you can find uh, all about the, the firm. There's sample research there. There's a contact form uh, to reach out if you want to you know, see about signing up or just ask questions. Um, and the, uh, the, the piece that I mentioned is uh, we're going to be launching first of January uh, called the Weekly Roundup, uh, which will basically be uh, elements from the institutional product. So the equity risk model I mentioned as a macro tool, uh, the stock selection process that I use, the quantitative uh, stock selection practice will highlight you know, 20 buy ideas and 20 avoid ideas every week uh, based on that tool um, and show the charts and graphs that go along with it uh, based on earnings estimate revisions, price trend, and valuation. So kind of a, a, an intermediate term fundamental uh, and, and price-based uh, model uh, that can help guide stock selection. And then also some macro commentary. So some of the stuff we've discussed today about you know, Fed policy, you know, labor markets, inflation will be uh, part of that research as well. So essentially drawing elements from what the institutional clients see and putting it together in a package that for you know $50 a month, uh, sort of the uh, more of the individual investor or small uh, institution might want to look at uh, as a way to trial it to see what they think and uh, and get some ideas from and see what the kind of uh, you know, institutional grade research looks like and then can you know uh, you know can approach us to see if uh, they want to you know move on to something else uh, and 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 get more of the institutional uh, research that we publish. Um, you know, for, for, you know, for, for higher sums that, uh, um, that we've been doing now for, for since 2016 here at Mill Street Research. Um, so it's, it's a combination of macro, uh, you know, asset allocation and global stock selection, but it is very indicator and model driven, trying to be as objective as possible. Uh, I know you've got your own, uh, you know, stock selection models and systems that you use and it, it, having a disciplined approach is really a lot of, uh, you know, kind of what I can offer to both institutions and potentially to individuals. Um, and then being an independent provider, meaning I have no conflicts of interest, I don't do investment banking, I don't do trading, I don't do anything else that would uh, sway me from recommending or being negative on, on any particular stock or asset. Um, so I can be completely uh, objective and, uh, and give my real opinions. Uh, so uh, yeah. yeah, so look that up. Um, so you'll see that starting in January. Uh, info at millstreetresearch.com is the email. Uh, you can uh, reach out to us and uh, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get right back to you. There's a Twitter account uh, for Mill Street Research as well as LinkedIn and follow uh, the postings. I usually post every day on Twitter uh, with macro commentary and uh, some other things uh, to follow along, see, see what things look like. So lots of ways to find us, but uh, uh, the website is probably the place to start. Uh, I feel I, I didn't give you an opportunity uh, on one other aspect that maybe I should have brought up, given your equity selection. Is there anything you feel that's uh, liberty that you're happy to discuss with us? What would be your favorite US pet uh, as an equity? What would be your favorite? I mean, obviously it's hard to distill it down to one. If you want to give more than one, you're welcome. Uh, your European or rest of world stock. Uh, do you have a, 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 a couple of things that would just be highlighters and uh, a five bullet as to why you like them? Um, if you have time for that, I'd love to hear it. And I'm sure the audience would as well. But another recommendation. Uh, with all the usual provisors, not financial advice, et cetera. Right. And, and normally uh, I don't try to uh, give individual stock advice um, uh, or, you know, over the, the media just because things can, can change. Uh, it is a quantitatively driven approach. So whatever I recommend today will be I pull up the spreadsheet and whatever's at the top of my spreadsheet uh, that day will be the stocks that, that look best based on the model that I, that I follow. So I don't do the fundamental research of talking to the company management and building my own earnings forecast and things. You know, I draw on the earnings forecast and aggregate that uh, the analysts publish you know, globally, and I build that into the indicators and look at price and valuation to come up with a, you know, a composite reading for, for any given stock in any given region. Um, so right now, for instance, you know, um, you'll see a lot of highly ranked you know, banks and financials showing up at the top of the US list, as well as some industrials. Uh, the technology names have been near the bottom of the list. 
a lot of the communication services, technology, large cap growth stocks have been near the bottom. I actually do like Europe uh, better than the US from a regional standpoint, because one of the things I can do is aggregate all these data into uh, industries, sectors, countries, and regions to see where the relative strength and weakness is. Any uh, pan-European, any specific uh, industries that you see under valuation and uh, good value? Yeah, so I think if you're looking for, you know, I think value as a sort of a style is probably still going to be in favor. So I think the uh, the financials, uh, some of the industrials that are uh, you know tied to um, uh, the you know, re recovery and, and transportation might benefit. Um, I think um, there are selected areas of you know consumers that might might do well, but I think um, a lot of those uh, areas that are traditionally considered um, you know value areas are probably going to do relatively well, and that helps areas like Europe. Where the, you know the, the Europe's trading on a 12 times PE multiple, whereas the U.S., which is probably 16 or 17 times, uh, I think that's you know, a relative benefit for uh, for Europe overall. Uh, but I think that um, uh, you know the individual names are are, are going to vary, and that's one of the things I can do is for clients I can carve out you know stock lists from whatever their particular mandate or universe is. So a client that's a U.S. focused investor will get a different list than what a European investor would get, and they might have market cap constraints and things like that. So I try to tailor, you know, what a client gets to what they can actually invest in and what they're interested in. Um, but uh, I think it's still going to be a uh, large cap value type of environment, and that's where the uh, the relative earnings estimate revisions uh, and the, the the fundamental drivers for my model are still showing up, you know, as, as being relatively strong. So in Europe, would that be, a, say, an automaker, a German automaker, Mercedes or BMW? That's an industrial. That's big. It's large cap. It's got dominant market share. Um, could those be uh, candidates, uh, or are you looking industrial or manufacturing? Uh, any other segments outside of, say, automotive? Or... Um, yeah, so I can uh, have a glance real quick and just see, um, you know, what kind of uh, stocks are coming up on the list. Yeah, so you're still seeing. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, you, you're definitely seeing some of the. Uh, uh, you know, mid cap banks, uh, things like that, um, both in the Europe and US. So the ones that are traditional spread lenders, uh, where the, the lending spreads have widened thanks to the, uh, um, you know, the central banks raising rates and the, the, the long rates uh, or the, the rates they, they get on loans have risen faster than what they have to pay for deposits. I think that's been a tailwind for um, you know, some of the, the, the mid cap banks that are um, less tied to capital markets and more tied to traditional lending. Uh, for the first time in quite a lot, number of years, uh, they actually have some benefits uh, from that. Um, I think you know th there's there's still some leftover benefits to the, some of the energy producers. Uh, I think they're starting to fade a bit um, now that oil prices have been coming down. But I think some of those uh, the structural demand for energy, particularly in Europe, is going to help some of those energy names um, stay stay you know uh, continue to, to to grow at least in the near term. I think you know five to ten years from now, the outlook is probably a little less strong. But sure. uh, over the next you know six months or a year. I think that uh, the loss of, of Russian oil and, uh, and the disruption in that market, uh, particularly in Europe, um, whereas the U.S. has much more domestic you know, exposure uh, to oil and can produce its own oil uh, to, to a greater degree. Um, and, and same thing with natural gas. Um, so you're still seeing some of that. But yeah, there are some uh, you know, machinery construction names, uh, those kind of names that, that come up um, and uh, uh, areas that you know, will benefit from um, you know, some of the uh, Potential for um, you know, rebuilding uh, and, and 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 structural uh, uh, kind of infrastructure spending uh, that's going to go on both in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um, so I think there's still there's still some demand from that side of the economy that hasn't been fully uh, accounted for yet. That will offset what maybe the consumers uh, are going to lose, you know, based on the you know, kind of energy costs and things like that. Um, so I think there's there's definitely still a certain amount of cyclical exposure that's worth having. Uh, both in Europe and in the U.S., even if you expect a recession or something close to a recession in the U.S., and that's really the uh, the kind of the, the the sort of psychological difficulty or the divergence um, that that I see between the bottom up and the top down. Certainly in the perceptions, most people think the the European economy will be in recession if it's not already, and probably think the U.S. economy will be in recession soon. So the natural tendency would be go defensive, buy utilities, buy staples. You know, only the things that are going to hold up well in a recession. Um, I think there is still room for those in, in your uh, portfolio, but I think there's still a room for some cyclical exposure from those you know, industrials, uh, you know, banks, some energy companies, 
um, that you know can benefit from uh, at least stability, if not some uh, some growth, and because they have been undervalued, they've been knocked down a lot, and the earnings estimates are actually holding up better than you would expect. Uh, so that's really kind of the surprise potentially, is that even though everyone's expecting recession, the relative earnings estimates are still actually better for some of these cyclical names than they are for the defensive names. Yeah, interesting. Excellent. Uh, Sam, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, great to have you. And uh, all the best. And people will put up those links for people to find their way to you. Have a great day and thank you for visiting us. No, thanks very much. I appreciate it.